Okay, we get going again. We're going well. So, transmission lines and antennas. This is exciting bits. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is how we get um, the RF energy from our transmitter across to uh, somebody else. So, um, a transmission line um, is the bit between the transmitter and the antenna, sometimes called a feeder, so it feeds um, radio frequency from the transmitter to the antenna. Key thing, pardon, key thing is the size of the antenna is dependent on the frequency to be transmitted. This is a concept that you need to know. Higher frequency equals a smaller wavelength, if you remember that chart. Um, which usually means it's a smaller antenna. However, lower, go lower in frequency, so come down to like HF, high frequency, is a longer wavelength, which usually means a larger antenna. So, and there's usually, a, usually a question in the exam around that. Now, um, we talk about impedance. Now, all impedance is, we consider it to be resistance, so it's ohms, it's measured, it's still measured in ohms, but it's resistance to alternating current, not direct current. So we talk about impedance, it's still measured in ohms, and it's resistance to alternating current, to AC. Now, a bit of the practical. There are two types of transmission lines. One is coaxial cable, actually, I can give you an even better example. Turn that round. <coughs> um, lots of different examples of coaxial cable. Coaxial cable is what we call unbalanced, and I'll go into that in a sec. And it's usually 50 ohms, so this is its impedance, or 75 ohms. Um, all of the amateur radio stuff that we usually do is 50 ohms. The television industry, though, still use 75 ohms. <laughs> your, the outlet on your television, uh, which goes to your antenna, is actually at 75 ohms. That's a TV, um, uh, TV standard. And it's usually, you can see on there, it's usually braid on the outside. So this sort of braid on the outside and then there is a centre conductor. Um, so one of the things I'll, we'll do in the practical is um, give you some examples um, and get you to identify whether it's balanced or unbalanced or um, coax or ladder line. Now the other type of transmission line is what we call ladder line or you've probably seen that, that's the old um, television, <laughs> television ladder line. Um, uh, this is slightly higher in impedance, so it can be up in this sort of region. That's 300, that's 450. Um, and there's two parallel conductors. So what we call, we actually call ladder line balanced transmission line. And the way, why I always remember balanced to unbalanced is, if you've got an RF signal that's cutting through this particular line, if it cuts through ladder line, it's cutting through exactly the same signal on both lines. So it actually, what ends up happening is the signal that cuts through it is actually um, what we call balanced because it is exactly the same signal on both lines. So whereas on coax, if you ch a signal cuts through that line, it'll hit the shield first before it hits the, the inside. And so you get much more on the shield than you will on the inside hopefully, because that's what the shield does. <laughs> um, so it's unbalanced. So, But we'll get you to, uh, in the practical, to identify which one it is and whether it's balanced or unbalanced. Um, we'll get you to do some testing of transmission lines with a uh, multimeter, and we'll go through how you, how you use that. Um, key thing here is what we're testing is the inside, obviously, inside to inside, outside to outside, which gives us the ability to test the con conductivity or the continuity between the end to end. 
but then we also test the outside to the inside to make sure there's no shorts. So, uh, so that's one of the things we'll be doing as part of the practical. I'm going to get you to identify some connectors. There's only three types of connectors that we need to identify here. One of them I already know. Okay, who wants to have a guess on this one? N-type. N-type, yep. BNC. 2.9. What's BNC? And? 2.59. 2.59 or UHF. Doesn't really matter. PL259. PL or SO two five nine P is the the plug, S is the socket. Um, so these are B and C. So these are half turn bayonet cap, bayonet cap. That's what it stands for. B and C. This one here and this one here, N type, and this one here and this one here are UHF or uh, PL two five nine or SO two five nine. SO239. Anyway, UHF, much easier to remember. <laughs> <laughs> much easier. Um, okay, there is the concept of a ballon, or when you connect, you've got a antenna here, which is what we call a half wavelength, because that's the little lambda symbol that I used before. Half wavelength antenna, or this is a half wavelength, what we call dipole. Die meaning two, and poles meaning there are two poles of exactly the same length. So we call that a dipole. And a dipole is a what we call a balanced antenna. Same, same story as balanced line. If a signal cuts through this antenna, it actually cuts through both sides at with exactly the same signal strength. So it's balanced. Now, if we want to then connect a, a bit of coax in here, we actually need to do a transformation from an unbalanced piece of coax to a balanced antenna. So what we use is a thing here called a balanced to unbalanced transformer, or a ballon. We just call them a ballon for short. So uh, it enables us to be able to connect a piece of unbalanced uh, feeder or transmission line to a balanced antenna. The ballon can also uh, do some impedance matching for us as well. So if the antenna is presenting a characteristic impedance of you know, 300 ohms or something and I've got a 50 ohm piece of coax, I actually need to do a transformation from 300 ohms to 50 ohms. So ballon also does that as well for us, or can do that for us. But that, what you need to know is the concept of a ballon connects a, a balanced antenna to an unbalanced piece of coax. So the antenna couples the radio frequency power from the transmitter to the space around the antenna. That's the magic bit. <laughs> um, and the antenna then radiates an electromagnetic wave by converting the electrical signals which are coming out of your transmitter to electromagnetic waves uh, at, that go move out from your antenna. Now, we've got this concept of resonance again. <laughs> the antenna should be resonant or tuned to that particular frequency that you want to receive and transmit on. Um, and of course, if it's tuned for receiving, it's also tuned for transmitting. So there's there's a thing called uh, reciprocity. You don't need to know that, but if it receives well, it'll also transmit well, and vice versa. Um, antennas are affected <coughs> by everything around them. <laughs> Absolutely everything around them. You can put up an antenna in one place and it works perfectly, and you can put it up in another place and it doesn't work quite so perfectly. So, and that is because uh, it is affected by height above ground, its proximity to trees, its proximity to buildings, its proximity to its surroundings. So, so electromagnetic waves which come out from your antenna and head off to uh, the receiving station or off into the, the uh, ionosphere, they are electromagnetic. 
So there is what that's telling you is there are two components to it. There's an electric component to it and a magnetic component to it. Um, and they are they are um, at 90 degrees to each other. So you can see here, here's a representation. You've got an antenna up here. It's transmitting. There are electric lines of force which are vertical and there are magnetic lines of force which are uh, horizontal. So, and it, it talks about here, generally the orientation of the antenna with respect to ground will indicate its polarization. The easiest way of saying that is Vertical antennas, so if I've got an antenna which is vertical, like that, and I transmit, it's transmitting what, what we call a polarisation of a vertical nature. So it's vertical polarisation. The electric lines of force are, ver in this case, my antenna is vertical. If I was to do that, it would be horizontal polarisation. Now, it talks about here the best results are that your transmitters and receivers have the same polarization of antenna. If they don't, you actually get loss and you're not, you're, you're not in the best position to actually receive that signal. So the polarization between the transmitter and the receiver really <coughs> need to be matched to get the best results. So, any questions? Okay, now this is part of pr your practical. There are five different types of antennas that we will get you to identify. Um, the very first one will be a half wave dipole. Now, what that means is, if you remember that, that diagram earlier with the ballon, you've got two bits of wire either side which are exactly the same length and the total length is half the wavelength of the frequency that you want to receive or transmit on. So it's called a half wavelength dipole. Half wave dipole. And you see there's a balance here and then a bit of a bit of a coax on here. Now the radiation pattern, if you plot that radiation pattern, it looks like a big donut. So so your antenna's in here each of the, the pole of your dipole is in here and there is a radiation pattern which looks like a big donut. It's called, and because of that pattern, most of the energy is coming out either side. Each end of the dipole, there is very little RF energy coming out each end of the dipole. Because of that, it's called a broadside antenna or a bi-directional antenna. So depending on where your dipole is pointed, is dependent on where the most of the signal is actually coming out from the dipole. And it is horizontally polarised because it's horizontal. One of the other antennas is a folded dipole, in this case a half wavelength folded dipole. And you can see, you see a lot of these on um, towers around the place. Uh, on buildings. Um, they're very popular, they're very robust antennas. Um, now the key thing here is in this configuration you've got a radiation pattern which is a big donut like this but you'll notice as a horizontal it's called a, a, a broadside antenna very similar to, uh, to the, the, uh, the half-wave dipole in a vertical component like this, it's actually an omni, what we call an omnidirectional antenna. Because if you think about, this is the donut here that is transmitting in universally in all directions. It's not transmitting upwards or downwards, which is, there won't be, there won't be people upwards or downwards, or stations upwards or downwards. So if you turn this around, it becomes a broadside antenna. If you turn it vertically, it becomes an omnidirectional antenna. Now the, the key thing with, um, with folded dipole is when you fold a dipole, the characteristic impedance is magically 300 ohms. So if you remember the old television antennas, the easiest television antenna you could ever make was a bit of um, uh, a clothes, um, oh, clothes, clothes hanger. Clothes, clothes hanger. Yeah. Bent into a folded dipole with a bit of 300 ohm line, 
And you had yourself a um, television antenna. <laughs> I remember rightly when I was a kid, we had one of those, and it was it wasn't even cables that you stuck in the back of the TV. Yeah. It Sp worked. Spot on. <laughs> it was the easiest way of doing it. Like occasionally, I've seen a few cars go around with antennas with yeah. a car. coat hanger. Same thing. Yeah. 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 I, don't know how, I don't know how well that works, mm. but if you if you bend it into shape straight, it, it works much better. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another antenna that uh, I'll be getting you to identify is the quarter wave ground plane vertical. So this is literally a vertical line which has a, a quarter of a wavelength of the frequency you're wanting to receive at. And then there are some ground plane radials that come off of it. Um, and again, this is a omnidirectional antenna because the, the donut <laughs> Is literally it's it's uh, from a vertical perspective is in all directions. Um, the ground plane radials are usually uh, about five percent longer than the actual quarter wavelength uh, uh, vertical component. Um, and a key thing here is this is one of the easiest uh, antennas to make because if you droop these radials down at forty-five degrees the characteristic impedance at the point where you connect the coax is 50 ohms. So it's really easy antenna to make. Um, an SO239 uh, connector on the bottom with a quarter wave length bit of wire in it and some radials off the side of it and you've got yourself an antenna in about 10 minutes. <laughs> really easy. Um, the other one, Yagi. Okay. This is uh, Yagi Uda, was the, uh, were the two um, Japanese scientists who actually came up with this concept. Um, they are multi-element, uh, so you'll find that there is a, uh, what we call a reflector here, which is about 5% longer, a driven element, which is what the coax is connected to, so that's the element you're driving, that's usually a dipole of some sort. And then there is what we call directors. And there can be a number of those directors at the front. Um, this is what we call a unidirectional antenna, or it only transmits in and receives in one direction, which is in that direction where your directors are. The reflector, the driven element, uh, um, driven element, that's where your RF energy is coming from, goes to your reflector, is reflected forward, and then the director directs it forward. So um, this, there's a, there, there's a good local example. That's a, um, a Yagi antenna pointed at the organ pipes, Mount Wellington. And you'll see the pattern. Oh, wow. This is a bit of a funny pattern. But the pattern you'll see, all of the energy is forward. Oh, wow. Now, this works in your favour because... Because they're unidirectional, what we say is they've got gain in one direction. And what that means is that all of the electromagnetic energy is directed in one direction instead of being, you know, omnidirectional and being directed in all sorts of directions. Now, when we talk about gain in antennas, it's usually measured in decibels. And decibels is a, a scale, logarithmic scale. Um, you don't need to know, you need to know the concept of decibels and the, uh, the commonly used decibels. And I, I've highlighted one here, which is, if we say an antenna has 3 dB of gain, what we're saying is it has two times the amount of gain. So whatever you put in, you're getting two times out, because it's all directing it in one direction. Um, and some of the other common ones here, 6 dB is 4 times, 10 dB is 10 times. Um, so if we say an antenna, a Yagi antenna, has 3 dB of gain, and I'm putting 10 watts into it, my, 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 ten, my foundation license 10 watts into it, the effective radiated power out the front of that antenna is actually 20 watts. So that works in your favour. So, uh, so yeah, effective radiated power... Um, can actually be be increased. So similar effect to having a high-powered transmitter. So worth worth remembering that. 
Uh, and the final antenna is an in-fed antenna. So this is, a, um, this is a piece of wire which is about half wavelength or longer in quarter wavelength multiples, hung in the, hung in the, uh, the air. Uh, you've then got a little line that comes down to an, an antenna tuning unit and then your, uh, your chain, your transmitter chain. Um, it's omnidirectional. Um, very simple antenna, very easy to put up. Uh, you need a tree to sling it over or a, a mast or something. <laughs> um, I'm glad he's urged the antenna as well. Oh yes, 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 well and truly. Uh, definitely needed for uh, this type of antennas. Um, so yeah, this, um, so NFED, and the key thing here is when you see a picture, when you actually see a picture that we show you, the key, the key element is it's fed from one end, <laughs> end fed. That's, that's telling you what it is. So instead of like a dipole which is fed in the middle, and the key thing about a dipole is both sides are exactly the same length. It's two poles. Okay, um, antenna impedance measured in ohms, um, AC resistance as I mentioned earlier. Uh, usually 50 or 75 ohms. These days everything in amateur radio is pretty much 50 ohms. Um, the output of the transmitter, which is usually 50 ohms, needs to be matched or have the same impedance as your antenna system. And this is, this is fairly critical because if it's not matched, what you're going to end up doing is all that, that, that um, 10 watts, not all of that 10 watts is going to end up coming out of your antenna. It's going to be reflected back into your transmitter because it's not matched. So, um, and it, it mentioned there, tr mismatched transmitter outputs, transmission lines, uh, etc., can also cause power to be reflected back and forth along the transmission line. So if it's not matched, that energy has to go somewhere. And what usually happens is it comes back down the transmission line, uh, can in some some remote uh, cases damage your uh, damage your transmitter. That reflected wave is called a standing wave. So it sits there and goes backwards and forwards between the mismatch and your transmitter as, a, as what's called a standing wave. Now we measure that, um, that standing wave with a meter and we call it the standing wave ratio um, and it measures how well your antenna is actually matched to your uh, transmitter. So just some mentions, connected between the uh, transmitter, and I'll go into that in a sec, where, it, where it's actually connected. Uh, should be checked each time you change frequency just to make sure that you're still matched. Um, and checking the SWR is actually a component that we take you through in the practical. And I'll, I'll show you an example. So in the assessment, um, there'll be some questions like, you've got an SWR of 2.6 to 1. <laughs> so a standing wave ratio of 2.6 to 1. That's really not good. So is that good, bad or indifferent or what do you need to do? So, so an SWR of more than 2 to 1 is probably indicating that you may have some sort of fault or some sort of issue with the antenna or how the antenna is connected, or etc. So, so, what's a good SWR? One point one. One point one to one is fantastic. That's <laughs> if you can get one to one, one to one, at a ratio of one to one, that means you've got a perfectly matched antenna and transmission line. Now you rarely have that, but if you can get that, fantastic. So. What they say is a good SWR on an antenna system is anything less than 1.5 to 1. So if you, if you measure, uh, and in fact, here's a real world example. And, and this is actually on the, the transmitter you'll be, you'll be using uh, this afternoon for the practical. Forget all this, SWR. <laughs> SWR 1.5, 2, 2.5, <coughs> infinite. So, this is actually indicating that's acceptable. If if you transmitted into a uh, into an antenna, and you can see up here, this is a signal and power meter. 
So what we've got here is we're transmitting uh, a certain amount of power. So that's great. And the SWR that it's telling me is actually less than 1.5 to 1. This is great. Wouldn't be worried about that. Go to this one. Mm, it's about 2. So starting to worry a little bit more. On this particular transmitter, anything above 3 goes red. <laughs> so, so on this particular transmitter, you're still transmitting power, but you've got an SWR way up here. So that's indicating that you obviously need to do something with your antenna tuning unit or you need to do something with your antenna if you don't have an antenna tuning unit, uh, etc. So it just gives you a bit of an indication about, in this particular case, this is good. This is not bad, but yeah, you probably want to see what's going on and this is not good at all. So, um, and we've covered that. This, this just gives you an idea. That, that's a... This is a modern sort of transceiver. This is the sort of display you get. On older transmitters that have a, a needle, you can see the SWR is the bottom scale, so one to one down here, 1.53 infinite. So anything past that point, you probably want to start worrying about. There's a power meter, so 0, 5, 10, 20, etc. This is on a slightly more modern and, um, transceiver where you've got a digital display um, and you've got uh, this is the, the power, if you like, the power reading on here, uh, as well as it's a signal, uh, it's telling you the signal level as well. Um, so, uh, and the SWR is the very faintest one on the bottom, which is 1, 1 1.523, <laughs> it's right down the bottom, really hard to see there. <coughs> Just. So, okay, an antenna tuning unit. And antenna tuning units can be all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> this is pretty boring, it's just a black box, but you can hand it around. Um, antenna tuning unit, that's an automatic antenna tuning unit. You basically connect an antenna and a transmitter to it, start transmitting, and it will match your antenna. You hear it click away, and you'll hear it click away in the practical, uh, and, it, and it then flashes to say that it's tuned. Uh, and that's all it is. And that'll give you then acceptable down to like 1.5 to 1. That's got a whole lot of batteries in it. Batteries last about five years. Um, the um, uh, Australian Antarctic Division use those uh, quite extensively for the groups that go out on the ice. Uh, they all take HF with them and that's the sort of antenna tuning unit they use. Just as a bit of uh, local content. Um, so the antenna tuning unit basically allows you to fool the transmitter <laughs> that your antenna is matched. <laughs> That's what the antenna tuning unit does. It, it makes sure that uh, it balances that, that match between an antenna, and the antenna can be anything. It can be a piece of wire, it can be you know, a, a, a bit of um, uh, pull-up uh, antenna, etc. And it matches so that the transmitter thinks that your antenna is 50 ohms or whatever in it, it matches that. So, so yeah. It's, it, it's not part of the practical, as it says here, but you do need to know what an antenna tuning unit actually does and why it's required. Now, what we will do in the practical, though, is we'll give you all of these components and get you to put them together in the right order. And the, the order is fairly, uh, is fairly reasonably critical because um, what you're having to do here is uh, put these into the order that uh, is most effective for getting a, a working transmitting uh, arrangement. So you've got a transceiver, you've got the SWR power meter straight after it, which is telling you whether the antenna tuning unit has done its job. And, and match the antenna. Now, there is a requirement for a, uh, you to know what a low-pass filter is. A low-pass filter just lets everything through below a particular frequency. So low-pass means everything below a particular frequency. It doesn't allow anything, any nasty other frequencies to go out above that, that particular frequency it's designed for. Now, 
What I've done here is there's a box around all three of these boxes. In most modern transmitters, all, both of these are actually included in the transceiver. <laughs> They're not separate. For, for the training purposes, we've got the separate components. There's a low-pass filter for you. Um, there's a SWR power meter, um, and there's the ATU. So, uh, but uh, in so in the particular transceiver you're using, there is one of these and one of these already built in. Um, so, but we'll we'll get you to actually put these into the order that they need to be. Um, and some uh, comment here. Some even have ATUs built in as well. So, um, so they'll tune to anything. Now, the other thing is a uh, bit of knowledge about a dummy load. Now, all a dummy load is, if you have a look at the end of that, there's a whole bunch of resistors. That's what resistors look like. Uh, and if you measure the characteristic impedance of that, it's 50 ohms. So what a dummy load enables you to do is connect up a dummy load and do the, make sure that you've got your 10 watts, you, you, you're matched and all of that sort of stuff without actually transmitting on an antenna. So it's just a, a very handy little um, uh, device to enable you to get everything ready and then, then you, you're, you're confident that you can start transmitting. What happens is that RF energy is converted to heat <laughs> in those resistors. So that's that, that conversion of energy. Um, and foundation licensees, again, 10 watts peak envelope power uh, and CW, FM or AM is an average of 10 watts. Any questions before we go on to the trial questions? Yep. Okay, the purpose of an antenna is... <laughs> I do like the first one. <laughs> 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 and there are quite a few quite a few <laughs> amateurs around where you drive past and go, mm, you're an amateur. <laughs> 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 they have very large antennas in their backyard. Um, so, a convenient place for birds to land. <laughs> oh. Um, allow balanced transmission lines to be used or convert electrical signals into radio waves and vice versa. D. It's D. Well and true. Now, here we go. The longer the antenna, D. the lower the frequency. It's an inverse relationship. <laughs> it's... The reason the antenna and transmission line are matched in impedance to the transmitter output is to... Hopefully not A. <laughs> Keep the SWR to a minimum. And the key thing here is, especially with the fact that foundation licensees are only 10 watts, um, you want all that power to be going out of your antenna, not bouncing backwards and forwards between the antenna and your, your transmitter. Because <laughs> you're doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> it's... it's <laughs> Okay, here we go. Um, antenna with a 3 dB gain operating with a 10 watt transmitter. So 3 dB is what? Two times. Two times, fantastic. So, so it, watts, spot on, it's C. It's effective radiated power of 20 watts. So that's money, money for nothing. <laughs> 